You guys might as well get started. Yeah, you're, you're happy. Uh, okay, in that case, welcome to uh, everybody here and those of you online as well. Um, so, yeah, I'm pleased to uh, present Natalie, who's joined us all the way from sunny Jib, Gibraltar, although you're saying it's not so sunny at the moment. Um, so, I, just, I, I won't say too much about Natalie because she, she can talk about Gibraltar and the work she does, but um, essentially, she's uh, doing a PhD at the moment, so this is very much uh, a talk um, in sort of early days stage of your, your PhD. Um, but in terms of her background, um, she did her undergraduate studies um, at Bath Spa University, where she did environmental science. She then did an MSc in uh, marine science and climate change um, at the University of Gibraltar. Um, and her thesis looked at the, I want to read this out here, that's right, the viability of an adapted systematic conservation tool on Gibraltar's southern waters marine conservation zone. Um, and she's done other bits as well, like National Trust, which I'm sure you'll go into. Uh, but essentially, Natalie's uh, interest is in, is in marine management um, and especially challenges related to the overseas territories. Um, so that's how I've got sort of uh, work with Natalie and, and uh, Gibraltar. So, yeah, thank you for uh, fitting us in on your schedule, in your flying visit. And uh, I'll hand over to you now. So, thank you. Great. Thank you, Matt. And thank you to everybody who's here online and obviously in person. Um, yeah, I come all the way over from Gibraltar just to be here this week. Um, so, yeah, so as, as you said, um, uh, my look, I'm looking at global best practice in marine management and how you can apply that to an overseas territory like Gibraltar, where you face a lot of challenges. Um, so, um, so yeah, so I'll, I'll just give you a quick overview of how I'm going to do this presentation. Um, I'll just give you a quick introduction, a bit of background um, and where I'm at with my PhD so far. I am only eight months in, it's still very early days, um, and at the end I'm happy to answer questions, but also if you have any feedback or any input that might be really helpful, then I'm also really looking for that as well. Um, I'll give you a bit of um, background on the context and where this sits in the bigger picture, and I will also give you a bit of an overview on what where I'm sort of going with this PhD. So, like Matt said, did my um, undergraduate in environmental science and I've always been quite interested in resource management. Um, I kind of, I think I realised that during my thesis I did sort of look at, um, for my masters it was looking at a tool that you could use on, um, for characterisation. There were a lot of holes in it, it was sort of more of a pilot, a bit of a springboard into my PhD, you know, I identified a lot of things that which could be, you know, which where it was more gaps, I thought, actually, I could fill that with my PhD. So 
when Awantha, my supervisor, said to me, do you fancy staying and do you fancy turning into, into a PhD? And I said, yes, please, I would love to. Um, so yeah, so thanks to both Matt and to Awantha for that. So like I said, I'm only eight months in. So what I wanted to start by doing was identifying global conservation um, and marine management good practice around the world. Um, this started with more of an overview. Um, I wanted to see exactly what, I just wanted to get an overview of what tools were being used. I didn't go into huge depth on how successful they were, but I wanted to identify things that also might limit or threaten those types of uh, marine management strategies. Um, and then I will progress to looking at um, identifying good practice and then how can you apply this and adapt this good practice to Gibraltar. Um, there is a big problem in that a lot of tools are used in many other places. You know, you have... Um, say the management strategy for the Great Barrier Reef is not going to be applicable in Gibraltar in any way, shape or form. So you've got to identify which ones, which, what is actually feasible under the limitations that we have. So my aims were to, uh, or are to assess the global and overseas territory use of marine conservation, um, which tools. Um, I've already identified systematic conservation tools as my main focus. I think this is because they tend to be um, well, if you've got no sort of system to it, you've got no organisation, your conservation is kind of all over the place. It's it's not going to be as successful as if you have it a bit more organised. Um, also, I want to look at the support provided by other tools. Um, so what feeds into this? Is this your monitoring programmes? Is this your stakeholder engagement, your community projects? Because especially in places like Gibraltar, you can actually do a lot of citizen science, which will always feed into better practice. Um, then I want to evaluate the consistency and adaptability of these tools and, like I said, apply that to Gibraltar. Um, so I started out, um, I needed to do my literature reviews. Um, I already completed my Global Use of Conservation's uh, literature review. That's been published. It, I adapted it firstly for um, in reference to the Mediterranean as a whole, and that actually got published uh, earlier this year. I currently have another publication under review at Frontiers um, in Marine Science, looking at the findings in relation to Gibraltar, because um, depending on how, you, or, well, you can kind of look at the data as a whole, or you can apply it to just, um, just Gibraltar. Then I'm going to conduct a review looking at systemic, systematic conservation tools. Um, I want to look at especially things like cumulative impacts, uh, pressure state response frameworks, um, ecosystem-based management, um, and then I want to look at systematic conservation tool use in overseas territories, and I will talk a bit more about that later because I'm currently in the process of doing that. Um, I also want to identify a way in which historical and recent marine um, data can be collected in a central source database. There's, a, there's not a lot of data in Gibraltar, but it is out there. The problem is it's quite fragmented. It's a lot of, um, for example, there's quite a lot of diving footage, but that's all on memory sticks of divers. They leave it at home, it's not doing anything, it's just sat there in, in, in some sort of data form and not being used. It's not being analysed. There's quite a lot to draw on from that. There's also um, quite a lot of uh, data from the Gibraltar Ornithological Society as well. And um, they have years and years and years worth of data on seabirds. But it's it, again, it's not being fed into anything to support the bigger picture. Uh, and then finally, I will develop a tool to facilitate marine conservation. Um, it will be industry focused and it will be more for stakeholder use. Um, this is because uh, they, the in Gibraltar, the marine, u, marine environment is quite heavily used. And I think management could, it's, it's not bad at the minute, but it could be better. So like I said, um, did the first literature review, I reviewed the global literature on marine protection. Um, then I identified which tools were being used and broke that down into categories. The categories were quite broad. They could be broken down a lot further, but to do that, you would uh, you be you could break them down forever. So I had to draw a line somewhere. Um, and while I was doing that, I also um, wanted to look at all of the factors that were mentioned um, that affect success of protection. But having said that, that doesn't always mean that. It, the level of influence was discussed. Um, the success of the tools was not always discussed. This is a very zoomed out picture of what is going on. 
Uh, my second literature review is doing something similar, but I also want to look at um, other elements such as where does the funding come from for overseas territories? Often it doesn't come from internal funding. Often it's things like um, Blue Belt Programme or Darwin Plus. It's not actually internal and a lot of overseas territories don't actually have the funding necessarily themselves to carry out these, you know, long term monitoring programmes because, I mean, you're probably all very aware, it takes a lot of money to maintain that and a lot of resources. Um, I also want to look at which monitoring programmes they have. Like, are they consistent? Are they long term? How far do they go back? Um, is it just an inventory? There's, I can't, I'm looking at the literature now and there's inventory after inventory after inventory. But that doesn't tell you anything about the current status. It doesn't. I mean, we've got an inventory. I mean, Eunice classes the rocky reef habitat in Gibraltar as healthy, but that's based on old data. In in the last five years, Rugaloptrix, um, the invasive brown algae, has swept across Gibraltar's waters and is currently taking over the rocky reef. So, is it still healthy? That's in five years ago, ten years ago. Yes. Now, maybe not. I also want to know who's responsible. Is it the government that's responsible? Is it NGOs? Is it charities? Is it students from the UK who want to go on a trip over there and do some research? I want to know everything. Um, I think this is quite a good example. So recently we got funding for a rewilding project on Windmill Flats in Gibraltar. So it's a large area of scrubland. So they want to restore it for um, birds, especially Barbary partridge, which we have, which is endemic for, to Gibraltar. It's funded by Darwin Plus, but we've only got 10 months worth of funding and we're already having to scratch elements off uh, such as eDNA and, and other types of monitoring because we don't have enough funding to do more. It would be great if we could do more. We could get a really good picture, but we, we've only got 10 months worth of funding and we're going to have to limit it to the most important things we've identified. So um, I'll just go into uh, kind of what the findings of my uh, global conservation review was. Um, like I said, I wanted to know what types are used around the world, how successful are they, and what influences their success. Um, I ended up with about 207 articles. Um, the four, there were four main categories. Um, uh, uh, they, they were fairly obvious. You've got your spatial tools, that's your MPAs, um, zoning within those MPAs or MPA networks. Uh, standardised evaluation, this category could be broken down so, so far, but you have to draw a line somewhere. And um, so this includes things like your pressure state response models, ecosystem based management, systematic conservation planning, um, any scenario modelling, climate modelling, GIS, uh, anything that has some level of standardisation and consistency. Uh, policy and legislation, that's fairly self-explanatory. Um, also, socioeconomic incentive. Um, I think it's been a more common uh, focus these days to get stakeholders engaged and uh, involved in the process, and it tends to be more successful if you do. So um, there were there were quite a number of these. Um, so as you can see, and I'll use the pointer, um, the international policy and legislation and regulation that was the most commonly cited tool used. Shouldn't come as a surprise, really. A lot of the literature actually comes out of Europe as well. So a lot of it would be um, they talk about, um, say, the Habitats Directive or the Marine Strategy Frameworks Directive. Um, they it was often more than not. It was a mention. It wouldn't say how successful that uh, legislation is. It wouldn't say um, whether uh, the country in question was complying with it or whether it was meeting the objectives that had been set. It was all just sort of, a, it was tended to be a mention that they had to comply with X, Y and Z. Um, also, standardised evalu uh, management evaluation, that came out quite high as well. But this tended to vary from country to country. A lot of them have um, frameworks in place. But, uh, for example, often the outcomes would be similar, but the objectives and the um, strategies within that that they were taking to get to that outcome varied. So there's not a lot of consistency um, and they all have different acronyms, different names. It, it goes on forever. Um, for spatial, marine reserve designation was uh, one of the most popular. Lots of uh, literature discussed. Uh, we have MPAs. Again, did not discuss the success, did not say how successful they are. And obviously, recent thing is paper parks. Is it actually doing its job 
or is it just designated to hit a target to look like you're doing something is it is it actually working um and then for socioeconomic incentive again like i said stakeholder engagement and involving the local community was actually really useful um they the the ones that actually did discuss success tended to be the, uh, the papers that were talking about uh, stakeholder engagement. Similarly, raising awareness also really helped. But I just thought it'd be good for you to see um, which countries actually came out on top. Um, Australia and the US actually had the most amount of literature. Again, probably because they got a lot of funding or research. Um, Australia, a lot of the research was in relation to the Great Barrier Reef and their management programs there. Um, the US similarly um, talked a lot about Florida Keys, that seems to be their main one where most of the research comes out of, but they also talked more about fisheries than some of the others. The one I thought was interesting was Kenya. Um, this was because uh, it seemed to be that most of the literature talking about marine protected areas in Kenya um, is because of the Mombasa Marine Park, which is one of the oldest in the world. And so there was a lot of research. Um, I think you, you get an accumulation of research over time. Um, there might be more research coming out of other countries now, but they've got to sort of catch up with the backlog. Um, also, they talked a lot about marine spatial planning and intercoastal inter -coastal zone management. Um, I think there was a there seems to be a lot of coastal development going on there. And so they, they are looking at better ways to manage that. Um, the UK had quite a mix, talked about everything from marine protected areas to um, management plans to monitoring. They, they, they covered it all, which was quite nice. Um, the Philippines, I thought this one was a really interesting one, that there was a lot of literature. And this is where most of the community based project literature came out of. They've done a lot of work with uh, local communities to manage to take on management themselves and decentralised governance to look after the marine protected areas themselves and they get the benefit from tourism. They might have to give up subsistence fishing um, to support themselves, but they get an income from the tourism instead. And that seems to be working quite well. Um, as you can see, there's quite a few places which, which don't have a lot of uh, literature. Um, the west coast of Africa didn't have a lot. This could be because there's not a lot of research being done there. There's not a lot of, um, or and, and also in the Mediterranean as well, there's not a lot come out of there. There could be a number of reasons for this. Sometimes it could be because they're not translated into English. Um, but I don't think I think in the Mediterranean, this is this could be partially the case, but also um, other papers have discussed that there is a lack of data and research going on in the Mediterranean in comparison to the rest of the world. It's going on, but it could be more. So identified systematic conservation tools as the one that I thought was the most important and um, what I wanted to build upon. Um, like I said, it varies between countries. There's not a lot of consistency. So trying to find the models that best fit Gibraltar is going to be a big task because I'm going to have to sift through a lot. Um, also, they're usually supported by big uh, monitoring programs, which we also don't have the capacity for in Gibraltar at the moment. I also wanted to look at factors. Uh, so it came out with six different factors, uh, well, six different categories of factors. Um, you've got your socioeconomic um, factors, which are influenced by the local community. That is pressures applied um, in case of, of coastal development. Um, this is quite an issue in Gibraltar. We're spreading out into the ocean quite fast, trying to reclaim land. Um, there's also the um, uh, in cases where you've got poorer communities where maybe the, they are, you know, subsistence fishing, they aren't able to give that up. So you can't just go and impose fishing bans on them. Uh, there's also the socioeconomic factors applied by industry. Uh, that is your shipping, your tourism um, and your economic. That is lack of resources and funding. Uh, biophysical. So with the failures due to biological and physical pressures, there are some that could you could argue fit in other categories. The categories, there was a bit of grey area between them. Um, it doesn't really influence the outcome. You still get the same sort of results at the end. It's just they don't, they're not necessarily in the categories that all people would agree with. Like, these are my categories. This is how I thought it fitted best. Um, governance, uh, you've got your failures from um, insufficiencies where a lot of, um, if you've got a lot of top-down 
uh, management and sometimes it doesn't always filter down or people aren't communicating within gov uh, government or within the um, overall management team. And finally, you've got your spatial failures. So is it too big? Is it too small? Is it too far away from others? That kind of thing. Um, I wanted to include this image. This is this is a map from 2013. So it is, it is outdated, but at the same time, it still paints the same picture as it would if you were to look at it today. You can see the ratio of amount of fishing in the Mediterranean versus the size of it overall, it's quite a lot. And there is literature from more recently where it says that um, the Mediterranean is is really quite overexploited as a whole, and Gibraltar is part of that. So I wanted to include that. So of the factors, um, commercial fishing came out on top. That was the um, biggest impacting factor, but also coastal development. Um, like I said, land reclamation, especially in the Mediterranean and in Kenya and, and on the east coast of Africa, uh, also in India a lot. There was a lot of whether well, they're, they're having to build out into the sea. Um, tourism, um, especially in um, sort of your, your sort of it, it seemed to be that tourism, although it's not world, a worldwide issue where it does happen, the impacts are really quite great. Um, Pollution, pollution. There, there is a difference between pollution and contamination, but most of the literature I read talked more about pollution as a whole and was often quite generic with it, or it would give you one type of pollution. It tended to vary quite a lot. There was not a lot of consistency. Um, also, their descriptions of pollution would sometimes be different. So it kind of had to almost be lumped together a little bit to a degree. But as you can see, um, nutrient pollution and pollution from industry and coastal development was the biggest issue. Um, in terms of economic, I think economic management failures was an interesting one because it wasn't discussed a lot, but when it was discussed, it was found to be quite a big failing. Um, for example, they would start up, um, they would start up a monitoring program and then within three to five years it would fail completely because they couldn't maintain it. They couldn't keep doing it. So I think this is this is another th thing that I'm looking at during my PhD is how can you overcome that? Because Gibraltar doesn't have the funding to have an extensive long running management program. How can you mitigate that? Um, Similarly, with governance, if you have um, poor decision making and poor co coordination and weak stakeholder participation, not just from government, but from all stakeholders, it's, it's not going to be that there, there were a lot there's literature talking about how if you have stakeholders on board, it's going to be a whole lot more successful than if you don't. Um, and finally, I thought that spatial would have more discussion. Um, there was discussion of how if there's not you know, it's, I think there was one paper that said um, lots of small uh, marine protected areas close together are more effective than one big one. Um, but I thought there would be more discussion of that. I think this is, this is what I was saying about how, yes, they discuss marine protected areas, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're talking about the success, how well it's working, and are they actually looking at what makes it work in the long run? Um, again, similar theme, USA, Kenya and Australia all came out on top. Um, the Philippines and the Caribbean, both of them mostly talked about how the impacts of tourism. So I also thought it'd be interesting to break it down by year. Um, I went back as far as the Geneva Convention, not because I didn't look any further, but actually there isn't any literature before the uh, Geneva Convention. Um, there tends to be spikes as you go along um, where every time they bring in some sort of new initiative, regulation or, or anything on, along that, those lines, um, there's a bit of a spike in literature. But it's, I thought the main thing was interesting was the further back you go, the more they talk about just designation. Um, sort of pre-2000, there's a lot of looking at, oh, we should start designating these areas. They start to draw out boundaries and they start thinking about implementation. Then as you go past uh, 2000, it, you get a lot more designation. And then what it starts to do is you start to get more scientific with it. They start to look at developing frameworks. You start to get um, more scientifically, scientific based monitoring with um, looking at, say, for example, eDNA or um, 
mapping, you know, better habitat mapping as the technology advances. And there's also, I think there's a drive to publish more now. So naturally there's going to be more literature available to look at. Um, so I also looked at just, I pulled out what came out of the Mediterranean. As you can see, these were the only countries that gave me returns. Whether this is a language boundary or whether this is because there isn't any literature, it's it's quite hard to tell. But for the most part, I think it's it's relatively safe to assume that there's not actually vast amounts of literature anyway. Most of it was uh, talking about the Mediterranean as a whole. It didn't talk about any one country specifically, and it would generally just give you an overview of what was being done. It'd say, oh, in Spain, there's a monitoring program. Oh, in um, overall, they all comply with the EU Habitats Directive. It didn't get specific with it. The only one that really got specific was Malta. Um, they actually, they, their um, full management plan is, is easily available and they break it down quite well. Um, as you can see, Gibraltar, nothing, nothing at all. Um, uh, out of the tools that were used, MPA designation was the one that was used the most. Um, whether or not these are actually doing their job, it's difficult to tell. Similarly, regional policy and uh, legislation, you get a lot of EU legislation um, or you've got things like the Barcelona Convention that they have to comply with. Um, and then also, but there's a big gap in things like uh, marine spatial planning and coastal zone management. I think it's, um, they obviously have marine spatial planning because everybody's employing that now, but they don't tend to make it as fully accessible or it's just, they don't, yeah, they just don't talk about it enough. There's not enough literature published and it's not readily available to look at. Um, so when you look at the WWF report from 2019, um, it kind of supports this idea that there's not enough literature and there's not enough research being done. 10% um, of, they, they, they all, uh, all of the Mediterranean countries, um, or nearly all of the Mediterranean countries did not reach 10% um, commitment for protecting their oceans. 2.4% of the Mediterranean is covered by MPAs, but only 1.2% 1, 1 um, is actually considered effectively uh, managed. And you can see all of that is in the north. Um, you don't really get anything down here. And it tends to get quite sparse when you get over into region four. Uh, whether this is uh, due to funding, whether it's due to uh, government priorities, it's, it, it, the WWF report doesn't go into detail, but it does say that they are failing. Um, also, this is a real issue because the Mediterranean is a biodiversity hotspot. Um, like I said earlier, it's one of the most overexploited water bodies. It's also experiencing rapid coastal development, pollution. Um, a good example is uh, in Gibraltar. Western Beach is actually currently at risk of being polluted on a regular basis by Spain because the sewage outfall comes out right next to the beach. And it is the only one of Gibraltar's beaches that frequently fails the um, bathing water quality tests. It's also warming at 20% faster than any other water body in the world. Um, and so, as you can see, factors follows a similar trend. Malta kind of talks about it the most. Gibraltar has nothing. The Mediterranean discusses it as a whole. And um, fishing and pollution, unsurprisingly, came out on top. But so did tourism. I mean, you've got you know, Spain, France, everybody goes there on holiday. Um, or, but it doesn't talk, it doesn't talk again about much about um, MPAs. It, it seems to designate, but without following it up. That seemed to be the, the general overview. Um, invasive species was quite talked about. They, they are doing more research. I know that there's more research coming. Um, for example, um, with the rubelopteryx spread, I know that there's a lot more research coming out. Um, a lot of the literature, if you look at it, it is, it's published 2019 onwards. So they, they are, there is a push to understand that and work out mitigation strategies. But how do you deal with, I mean, there's programs in Portugal to get rid of things like lionfish. But um, rubelopteryx is, a, is an issue that they've not quite tackled. Um, you've got blue crab um, and toadfish. That is, it, we're not quite sure how to deal with it yet, but the research is being done. Climate change, I thought, would have more discussion. But again, I think this is because 
I'm going into data from, well, research from a long way back, and I think climate change has only come to the forefront recently. So again, it's, 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 it's sort of having to catch up, it's playing catch up with the research. So that brings me on to Gibraltar. So for those of you who don't know, it's an overseas territory. It's in southern Spain, uh, in the Western Mediterranean. It's quite cool because it's at the point where the Mediterranean and the Atlantic meet. So you actually get a really productive ecosystem. Um, you get some really interesting species that you wouldn't necessarily find elsewhere. Um, it's got a small population, um, only 32,669. Um, but interestingly, there's a, despite everybody being really close to the coast, there's actually quite a level of disconnect between um, the community and the ocean. Like, I talk to so many people in Gibraltar. I mean, um, I used to work on the Taylor Morrisons, and they'd ask me, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm studying my master's. And they go, oh, what's that about? And I'd say, well, did you know there's a coral reef off um, Europa Point? And they go, no, I never knew that. So, but you've lived here for the last 50 years. How do you not know? So they just don't, they see the dolphins, and they go, oh, that's nice. Or they'll go fishing, and they go, oh, I know what fish are there. It's like, yeah, but you, you know which fish are there that you eat. Do you really know what's there? And do, how much do you how much do you identify with that? And how much do you care about that? They do teach it in schools, but whether the children are sort of taking that in and actually holding on to that and doing something with it is yet to be said. And also, it's only got a short coastline. It's only 12 kilometers long. Most of that's not natural either, I should note. Um, due to development, there's actually, there used to be rock pools and um, a lot more natural revetments. That's a lot of that has gone. So it's not it's not the coastline it used to be. Um, so like I said, what does it have that's worth protecting? This is actually a picture of Europa Reef. As you can see, there's Gorgonians and um, you've got loads of crustaceans, um, loads of fish species. You've got all sorts. I mean, you you also a lot of tuna um, and yeah, and, and a lot of seabirds as well. So, yeah, we've also got submarine caves. Those were actually surveyed a few years ago, back in, I want to say 2007. Um, they were surveyed for archeological purposes, but they did, they have got footage of Vladdy's Reef. Unfortunately, somebody anecdotally said to me that they dived there more recently, and that's now, it used to look like this, it's now covered in rubelopteryx. Um, we also have a merl bed. I think the merl is really interesting. So the, the only record up until last year of the merl bed was a hand-drawn map with merl written on it, and it was spelled wrong. Um, since then, so last year, one of our master students did a baseline characterization of that, and it's not healthy. It's nearly dead, nearly all of it. Um, but how do you compare that to what it was before? We don't, we don't, we, how do we decide why has that died? what's going on is it because of development is it because of um is it because of uh pollution is it just because it's warmer we don't know there also used to be seagrass um similarly with the seagrass the last record of it the last official record of it was in the 80s they went to go and survey in the 90s and it disappeared in 10 years gone um then finally, you've got these sublittoral sediments. We've got quite a range. We've got sort of um, a lot of different types of sediment. Um, again, none of it on the east side. The east side is all sandbanks. That had never been surveyed until this year when we've got a master student who is doing a baseline characterization on that. Currently, it's not looking good. There's not a lot there. But again, is that because it was never um, biodiverse or is it because it's died over time? We've got nothing to compare it to. And I don't know how much of you know, there is currently an oil tanker sat on that. Um, it got it got in an accident on the west side, and they decided that the best plan was to drag it around to the east side, put it on the sandbanks because there's nothing there. And um, then in subsequent months, they didn't quite secure it quick enough, and it actually leaked uh, lubricant oil, which then carried on around the east and west side and caused a massive oil spill crisis. So, like I said, most of these benthic habitats unmapped, uncharacterized, unmonitored. We don't know their health status. Um, also, what species do we have? We have a lot of marine mammals. We've got dolphins. We've got, um, actually, yesterday they posted pictures of fin whales just off the east coast. 
Um, we also get uh, sea turtles. Uh, we've got loads of seabirds. Um, I believe we are counted within the feeding grounds for the Balearic shearwaters. We've got a uh, species of Mediterranean shag, one of, and it's a subspecies, and the colony in Gibraltar is one of only few in the Mediterranean as a whole. We've got a lot of intertidal species, so um, you've got a species of limpet, the Mediterranean rib limpet, Patilla ferruginea. Um, one of our PhD students is modelling that, and he found that the dispersal it is likely due to the currents, and because um, the limpet is only really found in Gibraltar, um, but in a couple of other locations in the Mediterranean, the, um, the colony in Gibraltar is actually supplying all of the other um, colonies with larval, uh, larvae in, in all of the other locations. So if you get away, if you get rid of Gibraltar, there'll be no spread and it's the, the, their colonies will get smaller and smaller and smaller and probably eventually disappear. Um, also benthic species, we've got a lot of um, sea pens because we don't have a commercial, we don't have uh, any commercial fishing in Gibraltar. So there's no dredging. So the sea pens beds are absolutely superb. I dived down there two weeks ago, three weeks ago, and it was beautiful. It was just sea pens as far as the eye could see. Absolutely stunning. So if we can protect them, we really should. Um, oh, I should also note, we also get um, other species, we can get basking sharks, um, like I said, tuna, we get uh, sunfish, all sorts. Um, so let's take a little look at what Gibraltar has in terms of marine conservation so far. So we do actually have protected zones. Um, here we've got the Southern Waters um, SAC and uh, SPA. That is actually open to, com uh, open to recreational fishermen, although we do occasionally get um, Spanish fishermen who come over and fish. They shouldn't, they know they shouldn't. There is enforcement in place for that. Um, then you've got another number of other, within this you get, you have other um, small MCZs. There's also uh, around here is the Seven Sisters no take zone. It is highly protected. It has, um, we're trying to do a survey because um, somebody last year, one of, our, one of the master students did um, an abundance survey on, um, it needed more data, but they did an initial abundance survey on Europa Reef versus Seven Sisters, and Seven Sisters had um, much higher um, abundance of fish than Europa Reef. So it's, it, hopefully we think that it's doing something. However, last year they found crab pots there, so illegal fishing is still going on. Also, you have another issue in that around here we've got uh, Spain, um, went to the European Commission and asked if they could designate a large area of protected waters. It conveniently covers all of Gibraltar, near enough. Um, it doesn't say much for uh, conservation as a whole. It doesn't really impact, but it is politically aggravating. Um, there's already political tensions and this, this doesn't smooth things over in any way. But what do we have as limitations? I mean, like I said, we've got uh, our geographical location means that with the political tensions with Spain, that sometimes means that things can be a little bit tricky. Um, also, we've got Morocco not that far away. The Straits are a busy shipping lane. Um, it does make th for things a bit more complicated. One of the reasons that the, oh, and I should have said actually the tanker that's dumped on the east side is actually being removed today or this week. Um, and it's been there since last August. But they had to jump through a lot of red tape, I think, in terms of because they had to negotiate with the UK, with Spain, with all of, with all of the potentially impacting parties. So it wasn't it wasn't just that Gibraltar didn't get it out quick enough. There were there, they had to jump through a lot of hoops just to get it to that point. Also, we have funding challenges. Uh, the so Gibraltar is classed as quite rich in terms of the overseas territories. That's because we have a lot of gaming companies. That money doesn't actually stay in Gibraltar. The, um, your average person in Gibraltar is not actually that well off in comparison to, say, somebody in the UK. Um, we, so we're not eligible for a lot of UK funding, say, for example, the Blue Belt programme. But now we've, been, now we've left the EU, we don't get any funding from them either. Um, so we're only really eligible for the Darwin Plus funding. So they have funded £44 million worth of conservation in overseas territories, and Gibraltar has only received 25 k of that. So we haven't got the money to fund it ourselves, but we can't really get any money from anywhere else. We, I mean, for example, 
um, students in Gibraltar go over to the UK, and the and the UK government pays. Uh, no, the Gibraltarian government pays for their their student fees. Student fees it doesn't work the same way, so we don't get students coming in. Like we have to, we get students from all over the place, but they don't get any support when they come over to Gibraltar. So it's it's not really a two way thing. Like we we sort of we do a lot, but we don't get a whole lot in return. Um, there's also resourcing challenges. Getting stuff into GIB is a real nightmare, um, especially with the Spanish border. Um, like, for example, Awantha asked me at Christmas if I'd possibly be able to go and buy some lab coats and bring them back in my suitcase because there's no other way to get them. Otherwise, we'd have to wait for six months for them to arrive. So you can imagine what trying to get any sort of equipment. We do everything on a bit of a shoestring. Uh, similarly, staffing and training, it's really hard to get staff um, trained up and um, the Department of Environment has a number of people who are trained, but they're so stretched doing so many other things that they haven't actually got the capacity to run these ongoing um, monitoring programs or anything else. Um, similarly, we have a marine environment that is um, used really heavily. Um, you can't really scale that back. Cruise ships and shipping, I mean, we have one of, you can see here, we have one of the biggest ports in the Mediterranean. We can't scale back on that because that would hit the economy far too hard. Um, we have, um, there are, they're, they're pretty good at trying to manage it and trying to make sure it has as little impact as possible, but you can only do so much. Um, as I touched on earlier, there's, with education, there's not a lot of awareness um, and a lot of ownership. I think this is slowly changing. But it's it's there's a lot of tradition and culture, especially around fishing. Um, there tends to be or um, Gibraltarians really love the beach. They love going to the beach every every weekend or the, the we in the summer they do summer hours. So they finish work at 3:30 and then they go to the beach. But they don't really know much about anything beyond sitting on the beach, or they 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 have no interest in knowing. So it's, it is this lack of connectivity between people and their local environment. And like I said, there's a lack of capacity building and knowledge transfer. So we don't really do a lot of the, you know, the main monitoring, the bulk of the monitoring stuff in house. Um, and any data is, like I said, fragmented. It's all over the place. It's not really shared. It needs to be brought together. Um, and then on top of that, we have threats. So I've already talked about uh, the invasive species. Pollution, not only do we have the pollution from Spain, but also Gibraltar does not have its own sewage treatment plant. All of the raw sewage from all of Gibraltar goes straight off Europa Point and it's straight into the ocean, which is not great, but trying to get funding for a sewage treatment plant and also trying to find a place where everybody agrees upon is really difficult. There's been a lot of, they're, they're trying to, they've, they've asked for planning to put a sewage treatment plan in at Europe, uh, plant in at Europa Point, but they've had a lot of kickback from locals. Um, also, like I said, rapid coastal development. As you can see, this is, um, this is 2016 and all of the dark grey is reclaimed land. Uh, so literally, well, it doesn't say this is reclaimed but a lot of that is all built upon. So the only bit of natural coastline really is this section here. That's it. And that's actually um, right here is um, a UNESCO heritage site. So it will stay protected. But that's really quite small. Um, also, climate change. We haven't really quantified the effects of that yet. Um, but it is likely to, well, we, there's there's been more occurrences of um, storm surges, especially up on the up ground here and up on, on both on the top of the east and west sides. So this is something to consider. Um, a few years ago, uh, they had to rebuild the beach down here because it got completely washed away by a storm surge. Like that had been there for hundreds of years and then one storm surge gone. So they had to rebuild the entire beach. Um, and then also there's a the risk of oil spills. I mean, we've had a num we have had multiple um, issues. So, um, like I said, the OS 35 that is currently beached here. Um, the I believe it was the New Flame beached here, and Federer I think was also in a similar circumstance to the OS 35 where it got into an accident in the Straits and had to be dragged dragged to the docks. Um, according to well, Bethan O'Leary has already written a paper on it. She published in 2019, and she gave she issued Gibraltar with the highest threat score of any of the overseas territories. But it's not all doom and gloom. There are a lot of opportunities. One of the great things is, yes, we have a lot of recreational fishermen, 
and there is a lot of recreational fishing going on, but there are regulations on what type of equipment they can use, and we don't have any commercial fishing. So, I mean, more could be done to, I, I in an ideal world, I think there could be more zoning, but there are there is there is room for working with the local uh, recreational fishers to actually do something that's a bit more effective there. Um, we've got very small waters. It's quite easy to keep an eye on it. It should, if we had the funding, the resources, it would actually be quite easy in, in the, you know, comparatively to actually regulate. Um, we already have a large ratio of protected areas. So in comparison to the amount of waters, it's 65% of our waters are already protected, which is great. I think it's a good starting point. Yes, they're protected. Could they be protected better? Possibly. But it's a really good start um, because we're now not part of the EU and we're, we've got quite a lot of autonomy. So it means that we can actually do something which is a little bit different. I think Gibraltar needs something that's a little bit different to the norm because of the circumstances. You can't, it's not a one size fits all. You can't just try and shoehorn it into the practices that work elsewhere. So that's quite nice. That actually gives us a bit of an opportunity to do something that maybe has not been quite thought of yet. Um, massive one, the University of Gibraltar. We are trying to do so much research. Um, we we currently have so many um, little bits of research going on. We're trying to get involved. We're currently working with the Department of Environment to try and improve the monitoring program as is. Um, I'm working with two other um, PhD students currently to actually collect baseline data. It's a massive job, but the university has is as good as a starting point as you're going to get, really. Um, especially in September, they're starting a new environmental science course as well. So we're just adding to that at the minute. Um, and also there is a level of political will. The government does have other priorities at the minute, um, especially with Brexit, um, but they do want to do stuff. The Department of Environment are really trying to work with us to do more. Um, also, we, for example, we align with the Barcelona Convention. We, we're not actually signed up to it. We're not obliged to to do anything, but we have chosen to. So I think that's, this is also a really good sign. So where am I going next with my uh, PhD? So like I said, uh, my publication is currently in review. Um, I'm waiting on that. Uh, I want to conduct stakeholder in, uh, interviews with the local community to try and work out what good, what, what good marine management looks like to them and how can we work with them best to um, carry out something that benefits them and us. And, and the marine environment. Um, this will also include focus groups. Um, I'm also interviewing and talking with experts, so that's part of the reason why I'm here this week, because I want input from you know, people who know far more than I do. Um, I've got my literature reviews to carry out, and also I am helping out with the habitat and species baseline data collection. Um, so this is just a kind of general overview. I'll look at good practice, uh, get the stakeholder um, input, then I can put it together into a tool which I can uh, try and start developing. I'll trial the tool. Um, it's probably going to go back to the drawing board a few times and then hopefully I'll have something to issue at the end of it. Um, but it is noted that there does need to be a standardised data repository for this monitoring data. It is very fragmented. It all needs to be in one place where you can start painting a bigger picture. Um, the university is pushing for us to align with the MEDIN data guidelines and we are working with the Department of Environment to achieve that. Um, and also a massive thing is the capacity building aspect. It needs to be able to be done in-house with uh, what we have. What resources do we have? What staff do we have? What training do we have? How can we do this on a budget and still be effective? Um, this is quite nice because this could actually translate to um, other overseas territories and could be a direction for the future. So it's, it's definitely a good starting point. I am only eight months in, so it's, you know, it's a big task, but it's looking really exciting. So um, thank you to um, Amantha, who's not here. Thank you to Matthew. Um, thank you to the Department of Environment and thank you to everybody here for coming along. Thank you, uh, Natalie. So, yeah, as you can see, Natalie's on a, a one person crusade to sort out Gibraltar, which is, which is fantastic. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to open it up for any questions. And, and as 
Uh, Natalie said it, it's not just about questions. If you've got any information sources or any data or anything uh, that you might know about, and can, is it easy to see if there's questions online, Lee? Do they just is it on the if team said you should have the yeah, chat. so it would just be a hand to pop up. So yeah, if anybody's got any questions, and and uh, I mean, what, while you're thinking about that, I've, I've, I've got a couple. I mean, firstly, um, Morocco. So obviously, you know, it's just across the way there, and then I do know there are marine research centres there. So it, are, is there any dialogue? Is that helpful yeah, at all? there were talks last year. They're trying to set up a dialogue. Actually, the um, book chapter that I published in last, uh, well, I forget which, which side of Christmas it was published. Right. It was around Christmas time it was published. Um, we were actually working with a couple of people from over on the Morocco side um, yeah. to look at that, but it's it's definitely a relationship we are trying to build currently. Right. But it's not quite there yet. Okay. I, I mean, I, I've got a few contacts, but I'm sure you yours are probably better than mine because you live across the way. But I've got some anyway. Yeah, if you need some. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. Um, just one other. I mean. Oh. It, one of the things that was quite shocking, I'm sure you'll find the same, is we talk about problems with things like, say, ocean literacy, where we, we all say, well, once you get inland in the UK, nobody knows anything and all the rest of it. You've got, I can't imagine you can live more than two or three miles from the sea in Gibraltar. Yeah, I think probably the person who lives furthest has got to be maybe 600 metres, 700 metres from the coast. So, yeah, so you've got a place where you can't live more than a kilometre from the yeah. coast. And yet you've got really poor ocean literacy and and and, and the other things like um, enforcement, for example, you'd think enforcement would be an absolute doddle in that small area, but you've got illegal fishing, illegal crime. So I, I, I guess I found a lot of that quite shocking, but I wondered whether you could persuade people to almost use Gibraltar as a test case of how to do it right, because if there's any place in the world where you think this should be easy, it should be Gibraltar. Well, this is it. This is going to be a big part of it. Is I really want to get the stakeholders as much as I can involved, and it's going to be a bit of trial and error, I suspect. But the people we talk to so far seem to be quite willing. Um, the girl who's doing her, uh, one of the girls who's doing her PhD, um, is looking at tuna, and right. she's actually had a really good response from the fishermen. Okay. I think as long as you go in with the right approach. Yeah, they, yeah, they're yeah. actually quite keen to help. They really want to help. They're like, oh, by the way, I caught this fish. Oh, I did this. Oh, do you want to know about it? And which is really positive. I think that's a really good sign. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. No, that's good. Sorry, go there. Um, are there long term plans past the end of your PhD to sort of take it further? Ideally, yes. But we'll see. <laughs> I would like, I think it's something that I'm quite passionate about because I think. Gibraltar has so much potential um, and it's something that I think I don't think I'm even going to sort of get far below the surface with my PhD because it is such a massive thing. So I think it's something that I would like to continue long term. Right. Sorry, sure. we'll take, I'll take Anna first and then we'll go we'll work around. So. Right, that was really interesting. Thank you very much. A um, couple of things like um, in terms of maybe information and I don't I mean, you've obviously got a heck of a lot on your plate so this may be just like this is too detailed but um, a lot of the work I do is with um, commercial shipping and uh, military and um, there's this thing called in water hole cleaning which is essentially lawn mowers underwater lawn mowers that clean off the biofouling oh the I think I saw something about them yeah right. Gibraltar's famous for having as like being stationed like a little mecca for things to go in this country and many other countries it's banned um, because traditionally it's just imagine mowing your lawn and all the grass is coming out the newer systems have a, a system where they'll suck it up to the surface filter it and, and throw it back in with varying degrees of success but in Gibraltar it's very well known that you can get a fairly cheap open circuit um, cleaning system so there's two things there's the biofouling and the non-native species so if you do nothing there's that risk but if you do something um, again there's, there is a risk of um, or you know, perceived risk of uh, introducing non-native species, but also you've got all the antifoul paint particles, heavy metals, um, you know, there's a lot going on there as well. Um, so I was just wondering if there was any research into that, because to me that is very, very interesting and the legislation is changing very quickly. Yeah, I've noticed I was, I was sort of looking at things like build water legislation and stuff, it is moving very fast. Well, there's um, going to be a lot of biofouling legislation coming up in the next at least year, probably, you know, it's going to be big changes. 
Yeah. It's something that I, I haven't looked into it a huge amount at, at this point because, I, I mean, I will start to drill down on which pressures are exactly occurring in Gibraltar, but it is going to be something I'm going to have to consider because, I mean, it's a massive port. They're, they're doing so much maintenance work. It's going somewhere. And there's regularly, um, yeah, you regularly see sort of um, one of the students, um, not last year, the year before, did look at invasive species in the marina and was looking at um, some level of contamination. So I, I will be including that data and I think we're going to try and get more data on that. I think we're working with the Department of Environment. That's one of the things that's on the list of things to be looked at. Okay, if you want any information about whole cleaning sort of on the big picture thing, do give me a shout, I'll pop my card over later. Yes, but also the second thing was that we're doing a, I've got to go out to St Helena at the end of the year, we, happens to be well shot breeding season unfortunately <laughs> um to do a biosecurity or some biosecurity work out there um, and i didn't know if that was something that you could link into because the plan is that this is like a baseline survey that we're doing um and then the idea is that we'll help them build their biosecurity plan mm -hmm. and if that goes okay then they want to spread it out to other um, uk ot's yeah um, so again if that's a link up that's of interest mm -hmm. to you um, you can talk about that yeah, I'd, I'd love to talk about that. Like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I was on a meeting yesterday with the person from the St. Helena government, and I've got a meeting next week. So, oh, really? Yeah. So okay. Okay. Well. Great. Excellent. Great. Right, sorry. Um, yeah. Um, thank you for your talk, and you're taking on a really big project. Yeah. Yeah. And congratulations. Um, uh, one thing was uh, there is a tool that was you probably know or know it already is published by WWF. It's to assess the effectiveness of marine protected areas. Oh, yeah, I looked at that one. And then um, I know a place where it's very well used is Costa Rica. And you could also use them as an example. And I know many of the publications coming out from there are in English. So I think that could be like a good to look at and also if you need some contact you can let me know you know some people that might might be able to help you and my question was uh, when you when you are doing your literature review did you come across any uh, indicator on compliance with the policies which is something really difficult for all these conventions and all the legislation particularly like you see, as you were saying, it comes in paper, but at the time of measuring compliance, even for the convention itself, it's difficult. Did you find something yeah. there? In it was never explicitly said. It was kind of when you read between the lines, you had to infer, which is, I haven't put it in my publication because I think it would... <laughs> yeah, I think you, it's, you, you can't sort of say, oh, you're not doing that. But there was quite a lot, especially um, in relation to the Mediterranean. Um, in Gibraltar, for example, we, we have, well, up until recently, we had the Marine Strategies Frameworks Directive, and we were trying to meet those objectives, but we weren't quite, so I don't, I, it's not always a lack of compliance, it's a lack of capacity, but I think that there, there was quite a lot of um, maybe non-compliance or unable to meet those targets, but it wasn't really talked about. Measurements. Yeah. Um, Lee, can I shut that? Sorry, I should have been using that earlier. Apologies to those online if you haven't heard the I, questions. I think they can genuinely hear, and this one just goes into the room. Oh, uh, okay. Well, it's, it's, no, you're right. Um, yes, yeah, so I've got a bit of an interest in marine protected areas as well, but from a modelling point of view, I've done some work with the Ascension Island government to develop a forecast for their marine protected area and look at how the marine environment is going to develop over the next. 80 years or so. And I was wondering if you knew much about the forecast for around Gibraltar, if there's such a thing exists at all. <laughs> it doesn't exist. <laughs> um, the, the only mapping we have is the bathymetry. That's it. There's no habitat mapping of any sort current or not that's available. Even like physical modeling, I imagine, is quite challenging. It is. It's, it's a really difficult area to survey because of the because of the, you know being on the, being in the straits is quite is you know it's a dynamic environment. It is quite hard to map. Um, I there is work. To, they they are currently looking at. I think actually we've got a camera on loan from you guys um, to try and start mapping it. 
but it's it you know there's nothing currently available but i think it would be i think it's something that would be good to do if we can just sort of actually get it all mapped and and there's a lot yeah there are a lot of challenges with that also it's quite hard to map when you know you've got to watch out for massive ships coming in and out on a regular basis and and all of that so yeah it's quite tricky but i think it's something that we are looking at doing I mean, once again, you'd think like, you know, we're looking at comprehensive multi beam mapping in the UK and nobody complains about the scale of the issue. Ireland have managed to do it quite well. And you'd think Gibraltar would be the easiest out of all of them. But in theory, yes. In practice, not so much. Right. Okay, there we go. Um, Sam, yeah. yeah, it seems a bit crazy that um, Gibraltar is so close and yet receives, receives so little funding in terms of, yeah, understanding the biodiversity around the coastline. I mean, that itself just seems insane that we don't know where the pristine habitats are that, or the you know habitats we should be protecting are. Um, I don't know whether it's worth maybe speaking to some of the, the people who have helped get the Darwin funding. Um, I know Paul Rickle from the Falklands, Heather Coldway, been successful in Darwin funds um, and also in terms of Nicola Weber who is um, a lecturer at the Penryn campus next to her. She was out on Ascension Island for several years and she did their biodiversity action plans. Um, so it might be worth talking to her as well. I, yeah. I worked with her husband, Sam Weber. Okay, yeah. On a yeah. project for this interview. Yeah, so it might be worth getting in contact with them to get. Yeah, I mean, we do keep applying for uh, Darwin funding. Um, it's, it's quite tricky. I think um, that's why if you had someone like Heather Coldway, uh, yeah, yeah, on board. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, Jamie Davies, um, Awanta's partner. She, I mean, she, she's a part-time lecturer and she does a bit, but she's, she's, um, yeah, she tried to get a Darwin Plus um, funding not so long ago to start mapping the submarine canyon, mm -hmm. and um, she got told it was too sciencey. <laughs> And it wasn't stakeholder engagement enough. You need to map the submarine handling and see how much plastic's there. There you that, go. Well, that was that was I think we, we've got plans to sort of put in more applications, but it would be nice if we could get funding from other sources as well, because obviously they yeah. can't sort of just give it all to Gibraltar because we've gone crying to them saying, please give us funding. It's sort of, it has to be evenly distributed. So it'd be nice if we could sort of do, it'd be nice if we actually were able to get funding from other places as well. But if you do map the submarine canyons, I would be definitely interested in how much plastic yeah. is there. <laughs> yeah, we've had, we've got two students doing marine plastic surveys, which is actually quite transferable to the submarine canyon. So once we've got it mapped, okay. we've got the research ready to go on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can't see any questions online, um, but it sounds like there's lots of connections you need to make anyway. So, uh, yeah, so ju just to say, yeah, thank you all. I, 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 it's, it's really good. Um, it's exactly what I know Natalie wanted. There's lots of ideas and connections and things like that, which is brilliant. But yeah, thank you, Natalie, for um, yeah, including PML on your whistle top store in the UK. And uh, yeah, we're, um, it was a really interesting talk and good luck with, as I said, your crusade <laughs> to sort out Gibraltar. And I think you should talk to John Claude Hez, Minister of the Environment there. Anyway, I've, I've, no, I've, I've met him a few times. He's, he's really nice. And I think you'd make a great person to be trained up to take his job eventually. So there we go. That's what I'll finish with. So let's all say uh, thank you to Natalie.